Hey guys, I'm live. How about that? Let's see how long this live stream lasts today. It is uh, two thirty-six p.m. Pacific time. I just got in a short time ago from a nice motorcycle ride, and it is an absolutely perfect day here on the Southern Gulf Islands. Uh, it is twenty-one point eight degrees Celsius with fifty-five point five percent humidity, and a very palmy day here on the very northern tip of Salt Spring Island. It's funny. I just had a, a couple of comments from some Hawaiian dude. I, I'm, I, I expect he lives in the uh, Central Pacific and he didn't like the fact that we were flying Hawaiian flags at our place here. He thought it was disrespectful. Well, I find it completely opposite than that. I fly, we fly the Hawaiian flags out of respect for the Hawaiians that first settled on our island and I don't think they get, get enough recognition. So we fly the Hawaiian flags, the Kanaka Maoli flag, which is a newer flag, of course, and then the uh, original Hawaiian flag out in front of our place along with the British Columbia flag. We also have a Canadian flag and uh, no disrespect at all for the Hawaiians. It is total uh, respect for the Hawaiians. And uh, it's kind of upsetting that he thinks that I'm flying them out of disrespect and I should take them down. Well, I don't think so, dude. And I think he thought I was American. And I told him I am Canadian because I know the Hawaiians have a beef with Americans. They've always have. Uh, if you know the history of Hawaii, you'll know exactly why the Hawaiians have a beef with them. But they don't have, they should never have a beef with the Canadians. We haven't done anything to harm them. Uh, matter of fact, the Hawaiians settled here uh, in the late 1850s because they did get kicked out of the San Juan Islands and it became the U.S. And so 25 of them settled on the south end of our island back then. And the descendants still live here today. And uh, they've contributed greatly to our island. Uh, they have luau's every year. They've, they built the, the oldest church on our island was built by the Hawaiians. And it is a graveyard. And uh, most of, the, uh, of you here probably heard me talk about the Hawaiian history on Salt Spring Island. Uh, there's a really good book uh, put out by Tom Koppel called The Kanakas. And it tells you about the Hawaiians and the history here in the North Pacific. So uh, you can probably get it on Amazon. I have it. I was lucky enough. Somebody gave me a copy of the book. I do like Hawaiian history. We do love going to Hawaii and uh, we will always fly the Hawaiian flags out in front of our place here. And it's definitely not out of disrespect. So I don't understand where this Hawaiian dude is coming off on me and telling me it's disrespect for the Hawaiians. So a lot of Hawaiians are still very bitter. And uh, well, I mean, maybe they have, they have a right to be bitter, but uh, I respect the Hawaiians and the Kanaka and I respect the Aina when we're there too. So, and I like Hawaii because it's a very different place than uh, the mainland USA. They have their own culture and I like the Hawaiian people and I have many Hawaiian friends and they are very good people. You respect them and you respect their land and you shouldn't have a problem. But this dude is bitter, man. And I don't like bitter. You know what I mean? I'm not bitter towards anybody. Anyway, I um, hope everybody's having a good day out there. It's absolutely beautiful. I hear Wendy dremeling some artwork in the background. She painted this really cool piece of driftwood. And, uh, and then she's dremeling around the edges of it. So today, uh, this morning was busy. I went for a motorbike ride. I came home, uh, carved a tiki or two, and then I delivered the tikis. I delivered uh, one to a friend for his exotic garden. And then I delivered one to Beachside Cafe. I said, you definitely need a tiki in here, a driftwood tiki. And they says, okay. So driftwood tiki was delivered there. I delivered them, actually two of them. One bigger driftwood one and one tiny little arbutus one. So the rain a couple of days ago was really good. I still... Um, didn't have to water um, majorly here. I watered a few things, but uh, most part, the garden is still pretty good. Uh, but tomorrow, I probably will have to water. The long-range forecast is uh, drier weather again. And uh, temperatures just like this. I think about 21, 22 degrees Celsius right across the board. Absolutely perfect. I love this weather. And uh, it's not hot and it's not cold. It's just right. And to me, that is just the absolute uh, perfect conditions for being outside the garden, motorbike riding, or swimming at the lake. The lake was absolutely packed when I drove by with tourists. There's a lot of tourists here, a lot of tourists in town, and uh, we actually got our first uh, stay in our b, &B. They booked in last night. It was a last-minute booking. They booked it around uh, 6 or 6.30, and we happened to go out for dinner, of course, that night. Wendy gets home. There's a message on the machine. Oh, there's people coming. They're in town having dinner and they're going to come and stay at our B&B. So anyway, we have the first uh, guests have arrived uh, to stay at our B&B. And next week, we're all booked up with the B&B. So Wendy's very happy, but uh, rigorous uh, sterilization between each check-in. Uh, people check in at 3 and check out at 11 a.m. So uh, there's going to be a lot of sterilization. Aficionado. 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 Cool. See you in there, man. 
Um, yeah, so uh, B&B is booked up. So Wendy is very happy about that. Usually it's a lot busier. We're booked out right through solid. But I know next week is booked. And then she's got some sporadic bookings uh, throughout the rest of the month, which is really good because that really makes up a good part of Wendy's income. She works at another uh, uh, inn, like a hospital. She's in the hospitality business. But because of you know what's going on in the world, that's been closed along with a, a lot of other things. And our B&B has been closed too, but it is open now. And things are going. The gallery's open. Wendy's doing some artwork. I'm doing some carving. And uh, I do like to carve. I just got to keep it to a dull roar when we have B&B guests here because uh, the noise of my chainsaw might wake them up. Um, so I got to start a little bit later. Anyway, great uh, motorcycle riding weather. I, uh, I've been out for quite a few rides already. And I got to get my money's worth out of my bike. You see, I only licensed my bike for three months uh, in the summer months. I used to license it year-round, but I don't like uh, riding in cold weather. So uh, today I took a nice little boot to town and uh, popped off at the coffee shop, had a nice cup of Java. And I'm not even much of a Java drinker. I rarely ever drink coffee, but there's a coffee shop in town called Beachside and they have really good coffee. So I get a small dark roast and I usually just sit out on the patio there. Uh, Wendy joined me today and we sat out on the ocean side and uh, just looked at the ocean. It was beautiful. It's also a kayak uh, rental place too. And they have a B&B &B there. So coffee shop slash cafe slash paddleboard kayak rental and you can check them out online beachside uh cafe and kayak rentals uh in ganges on salt spring island so hope everybody's staying safe out there and doing well and hope you're having good weather i know it's baking hot in some areas i'm so glad it's not doing that here uh i was i met up with a friend last night that i hadn't seen for years that moved here from toronto uh, about uh i'm thinking about 18 years ago 17 18 years ago we moved to uh, salt spring island and uh, he is so glad to be here on the rock. He just recently moved to uh, Victoria, though, about a year and a half ago. So he's over here and uh, enjoying it and uh, liking the uh, weather. He says he does not miss sweating to death uh, in the summer months there with all the humidity and heat and freezing to death in the winter. So anyway, uh, hi, Joe. Great weather here in Victoria. Yes, Victoria is beautiful weather. We have 21.8 here currently and 55.5%. Uh, Humidity. Yeah, my friend uh, popped by last night with Wendy's sister-in-law. Ended up, this guy ended up dating Wendy's sister-in-law, which ended up being my friend. What are the odds of that? Small world. So he moved from Salt Spring to James Bay. So she lives in James Bay. He lives in James Bay. And if I was to live in Victoria, that's one area I really like. I love James Bay because it is a very good in the Zone 9A a microclimate, and there's lots of nice palm trees there. We stayed on the corner of Montreal and Ontario Street. You probably know where that is in a really old house and we actually swapped the lady was doing some course over here and uh, Wendy said let's do a house swap so we uh, swapped so she stayed in our accommodation here and we stayed in her hundred and uh, I don't know 120 something year old house there in uh, in James Bay and it's amazing because there is a super tall old palm tree across the street and I've always admired that palm tree when I go to James Bay I um, I take pictures of it and it's funny, we checked in late at night, we got into the place, it was dark. And in the morning, I go out the front door and I see this 30 foot palm tree. I go, man, can you believe it? I'm right across the street from the palm tree I love. And that palm tree was planted in the 1940s down the road. And then around 1974 or 75, uh, a guy named Wally moved it there and planted it beside that house. And he's also planted another one there too. So there are two nice palm trees growing beside that old Victorian style house in James Bay. So on the corner of Montreal and Ontario Street, that is the oldest palm tree in Victoria. There's some nice old palm trees in Victoria, but I believe that is the oldest one and uh, planted in the mid 1940s. All right. So it's a Trachycarpus fortunae. There's also uh, some old palm trees up island as well. And there's other ones in Victoria. Down on Kipling Street, there's some big ones that were planted about 50 years ago. Um, 428 Kipling Street, really nice uh, grove of palm trees there. And of course, there's some in Tofino. There's another old one, really old one in Tofino, planted in 1948 at uh, Kenning, Kenning Dot Gibson's place on the water. And there's some massive cordy lines there too. Just absolutely huge cordy line Australis. But we all know, and if you know your climatic zones, that Tofino is probably the mildest growing zone in all of Canada. And uh, we're a notch below those guys here on Salt Spring Island. We're mild, but it's just a little bit milder in Tofino than here, but it's a heck of a lot wetter too. So... Anyway, you can see the palms behind me are doing very well. And uh, yesterday I potted up our Trachycarpus uh, nanoteal 
uh, cross um, Bulgarian strain for Tunai, and also Trachycarpus wagnerianus cross Bulgarian strain Trachycarpus for Tunai. So they should prove to be very cold hardy. And my plan here on Salt Spring Island is to get some palm trees growing at the Buddhist monastery monastery up on top of Mount Tuam. And it's got to be a couple thousand feet above sea level. And I want to see some palm trees growing up there. So um, I was uh, at Musgrave Landing last week, uh, last Saturday, carving a tiki for a customer. It's an hour and 15 minute drive south, southwest of here. And we did pass the road up to the Buddhist monastery, but I didn't have any palms with me. But next time I trek up that way, I'm definitely going to deliver. I'm going to bring some palm trees and I will plant them at the Buddhist monastery on top of the island and see if we can have some highest elevation palms growing on Salt Spring Island and possibly the North Pacific. Wouldn't that be cool? So I'm going to use, um, I'm not going to use the Bulgarian strain. I'm going to actually use Razorback strain because Razorback palms from Tra uh, Arkansas are very, very tough. Af aficionado, do you have Yucca rostrata? No, that's one I've always had on my list. And I'll tell you about Yucca rostrata. There's lots of Yucca rostrata here on the Pacific coast of Canada. There's some nice ones on Salt Spring Island. I was at a Palm Society barbecue about a decade ago. And uh, he had a bunch of them there for sale at the place where we were because it was raised nursery, tropic to tropic plants. And I and I walked on the ferry. I had a friend pick my wife and I up. And uh, I even had the yuccas in my hand. I was looking at trunks about them. He wanted about 50 bucks, 60 bucks for them, something like that. I says, I'll get them next time I'm out. Well, guess what? The next time I was out, they were all gone. And I haven't got any since. And that was about a decade ago. So that is on my list. We grow a ton of yuccas in our garden here, okay? We have a lot of different types of yuccas. Our biggest alifolia, or not alifolia, um, uh, gloriosa is actually taller than me. It's got over six feet, uh, it's six feet tall, over six feet tall, at least big trunk on it. So we have a lot of gloriosa in our garden, recurva folias. And uh, we have, um, oh, what else do we have? Villamentosa. And uh, we have a bunch of other varieties too. So um, yuccas are fully hardy here and rostrata will do very well here in our garden. I just have to get a hold of one. I would preferably like to get one with a bigger trunk on it. There's a gal uh, that has a really nice uh, desert garden right across from where I park, our, where our parks offices are, where we park our parks trucks. And she's got two restrata in her garden. And uh, she planted them quite small about five years ago. And they're pretty good size right now. They're about like this with, you know, the trunks about, I think about here. And then she's got the little, um, the spikies coming off of it, right? The leaves. And uh, they really look nice. She's also got alifolia, Spanish dagger in there and beautiful cactus and lots of other uh, succulents. So if I can find one, I will get one for our garden. And uh, hopefully soon I will be getting a bunch more yuccas for our garden from a local friend of mine. He likes to weed out his yucca patch and uh, then we plant them around the uh, garden. So you can never have enough yuccas. We like them because they're drought tolerant. Uh, the deer do tend to nip the ends of the leaves uh, once in a blue moon. We have a lot of deer here. Oh, excuse me. And uh, they nip the... Uh, they nip the leaves off every so often on the new growth. And you know what else they do? They eat the flowers off, which is really annoying. They'll eat the flowers off the yuccas. So I had some beautiful recurva folia in bloom uh, last year. Went out to enjoy those flowers, and they ate pretty much every single flower bud, bud off the uh, off the cact, off the uh, yuccas. And that's what we say here on Salt Spring Island, kill and grill. So you kill the deer, and then you uh, do what you have to do, and you throw her in the barbecue, right? So we have a lot of deer here on Salt Spring. And uh, deer meat is very good. Unfortunately, uh, some people don't eat it because they're vegetarian, but I'm not a vegetarian. I like venison. So, uh, yeah, we have a friend down the road from us that does a lot of venison. And uh, I've had his uh, venison uh, pepperoni and the sausages. It is really, really good. And I've had deer steak too. Very, very yummy. There was a big buck that hangs around our garden here. He was, um, I took some pictures of him the other day. He was trying to well, if the fence wasn't there, he would be in the garden eating everything up, the vegetables. But he was looking right at the gate and had a rack on him, nice new rack coming out with the fuzz on it. And uh, they're very destructive because what they do is uh, they will rut on your plants and destroy them. I'm off to James Bay to see those palms tonight. Okay, so that one is on the corner of Montreal and uh, Ontario Street, okay? And you can check it right out here on my YouTube channel. I have videos of it. Uh, I have a video. I used the thumbnail of the owner stand beside it because I talked to him, but he did a really nice job on uh, restoring the house. It was in pretty beat up shape years ago, and uh, he's really made it look nice. So corner of Montreal and Ontario. 
You can't miss it. It's a very tall palm beside a very old house. But uh, check out old palm trees in Victoria on my channel and you will see the palm trees or just palm trees in Victoria. You'll see it. Uh, 428 Kipling Street uh, down in Fairfield. You will see some nice palms. The largest private grove of mature palm trees in one front yard is on Kipling Street. If you look across the street, there's palm trees in the neighbor's yard. You can't see the ones in their backyard, but there's big palms in the backyard too. I've been in the backyard probably about 20 years ago. They showed me around and I took some pictures. Are you in the Canadian? I I'm in the Canadian jungle. Yes. This old helmet. We are in Canada. We are in the North Pacific on a small Island in the North Pacific. So yes. And we do have a, Temperate jungle there. You can see it right behind me. There is part of the temperate jungle, and it really is. It's kind of like so thick here. Parts of our place, you need a machete to get through, but that's the way we like it. We like it thick. We like it low maintenance, and we like zero lawn. No lawn, okay? When I get from home from work, I don't want it. I don't want to look at any lawn because that's my job. I look after sports fields and park lawns. So the last thing I want to do is look at a lawnmower and a lawn when I get home. So our garden is very low maintenance just pathways uh, going through uh, jungle-like gardens. And if you ever visit Salt Spring, we'll show you what uh, what I'm talking about. It's uh, very, very, um, very, very exotic and very, very tropical looking, even though it's not tropical, but uh, very tropical looking. You just uh, pick the right plants and you can create a real jungle-like garden. I've been at it for a long time, so these plants are very established and they're getting very big now. And uh, I'm looking at the eucalyptus trees and they are absolutely spectacular with the... Uh, crystal clear blue sky behind him. Yes, the Canadian jungle, the banana belt, Canada's Hawaiian Island. Yeah, you have my interest. Well, low maintenance is the way to go. I mean, the problem is with so many gardeners, they waste their time with lawn, manicuring it, putting that crappy weed and feed garbage on it, which is actually 2,4-D. They don't even know that. And they're interested in their lawn and wasting water on it and getting rid of the weeds in their lawn and mowing it. I can't be bothered. So uh, we had a little patch of lawn, a couple patches of it. When my kids grew up and were out of the house, I got rid of the last patch of lawn and put more palm trees on top of that. So, uh, yeah, our pathways are kind of like uh, eucalyptus bark and uh, wood chips. And it is really, really low maintenance. And it's rare that you even have to weed our garden because uh, there's so many plants in here. The ground covers, there's masses of ground covers. There's no competition. The weeds uh, really can't grow in there. And uh, it is really, in, uh, the understory is more palms and exotica. You'd have to see it to believe it. You can see the videos on here. Uh, maybe videos really don't do it any justice. You'd have to actually walk through the garden. We have a very large garden, and it takes at least an hour to walk through our garden if you want to see our whole garden. There's a lot of different uh, areas and levels. It's all kind of stepped, and it goes down, and it weaves around, and there's corridors in it. And uh, wherever you go, you're going to see palms and exotica. It is overflowing with a mix mash of palms and exotica in no particular order. And that's the way I like a garden. I like a wild, jungly, unmanicured garden, but that still looks good. And when people come here on tours, it still gives them the wow factor. That's the way to do it, Rand. Uh, yeah, try it. Exotic gardens should be pretty low maintenance. I keep uh, half a lawn, half managed woods, uh, Georgia. Yep. Uh, view the look up. Cool. Well, you know, we have woods here too. We have forest all around us, see? There's forest all around us here. I'm surrounded by forest and even across the street, we're across the street from the ocean, but you do not see the ocean because it's just forest bring us the 900 foot uh, barrier of forest between us and the ocean, which is nice because it'll stop any winds. If any winds want to come off the ocean, we just don't get them. Yeah. Ken S. I plan to visit Fraser Thimble. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, come and visit our garden. Just let us know when you're here. Fraser Thimble Farm is about a one minute to two minute drive north of our place, okay? We're right on the very northern tip of Salt Spring Island. Yes, I always have this map here. Okay, so I'm gonna show you where Fraser's Thimble Farm is, okay? Okay, Fraser's Thimble Farm is here. Fraser's Thimble Farm is right there. You see that? And we're right here. That's where we are. Fraser's Thimble Farm is here and we're here. So it's very, very close. We're on the very north end of Salt Spring Island. If you come from Victoria, you're going to come into Fulford Harbor here, and then you're going to drive all the way up to Fraser's Thimble Farm. There's also another nursery in Ganges called uh, Fox Club, and then there's a really nice exotic plant nursery on Vesuvius Bay Road called the Plant Farm. And uh, you can check those ones out, too. They're really uh, quite nice with lots of exotica. Uh, you can't get the living in a subdivision. No, we are so far. We're out rural. It's We're out in the boonies, okay? And, um, yeah, it's very rural, this entire island. There's no traffic lights 
and uh, no street lights here is, and uh, that's what it is. It's just a very laid back island out in the ocean. So it's much different than the city, that's for sure. Uh, how do the Swampsonii do during your dryer? They do fine because it's always uh, Vincenze. It's always wet where they grow Vincenze. They're down in a, a deep ravine, very, very deep ravine. And it's always moist down there. They're beside a creek and it never dries out. So it's always moist. Is that as big as Ireland? No, it's uh, small. Our island is 16.7 miles long. But I'm guessing Vancouver Island, the big island to the west of us, would be as big as Ireland or bigger than Ireland. Uh, Vancouver Island to drive from one end to the other takes about seven or eight hours, okay? Uh, or over seven hours to drive from Victoria to the very northern tip of Vancouver Island. So Vancouver Island is huge, huge. So I'm guessing it's it's bigger. Yeah. Yeah, Ken, we're very close to Fraser's Thimble Farm. I know Richard and Nancy very well. Uh, my oldest son went to school with their daughter. And I think my, yeah, my daughter probably went to school with their son. And uh, very good people up there. And I like the quality of plants they have. They have a lot of tree ferns, if you like tree ferns. They have a lot of tree ferns. I was just in my buddy's garden uh, in Ganges there, and uh, we were watching him perform uh, last night at one of the uh, clubs, the Oyster Catcher. I don't know if you heard of the rock band Grapes of Wrath from the 80s. He's the lead singer of the Grapes of Wrath, a friend of mine, Tom. And uh, I was talking to him last night just after his, he performed. He was taking an intermission, came up and yapped with us at the table at the restaurant. And uh, I says, and he said, come by sometime. So I happened to be driving by his place. There was Tom out there, and that was only about an hour ago. And, uh, yeah, he's got about five tree ferns in his garden. And some of the palm seedlings that I planted for the previous owner are up there now. So he's got a, a few nice palm trees in his garden, too, doing very well at Tom's place. How much do you think the entire palm tree collection cost? You? Oh, God. Probably a hundred and something thousand. <laughs> Easy. I don't think you can really put a price on it. Somebody said that last night that come visit our place. Did you know how much your landscaper? We have thousands of palm trees, okay? But it's not just the palm trees here. It's all the other plants we grow. We have, well, you'll see when we're here, we are plant collectors and uh, we have a lot of plants, a lot of different species of uh, plants here. So you know how much palm trees are worth. They're worth about a hundred dollars a trunk foot. So all you guys that grow palm trees, your palm trees are worth a fortune. So when I see people cutting down palm trees, I go, what the heck is wrong with you? If you don't want them, dig them out and sell them. Somebody will, um, somebody will buy them. But uh, yeah, we have a lot. And it's really hard to put a dollar sign on, um, on the garden plants because I mean, they're irreplaceable, some of them, right? I mean, I look at our tree fern. It's got six feet of trunk and it's going into its 27th year. Uh, I don't think I could really put a price on that thing. I know to buy one at a nursery, you're going to probably pay about $20 a trunk inch, but uh, I'm never selling that thing. I think if I ever moved, I would probably dig it out and take it with me because I do like it a lot. And it is one of my favorite plants uh, in the garden. Uh, and if I ever moved from here, which I probably won't, I'll leave everything just the way it is. Everything else will stay in the garden. I'd bring some potted palms and bring them with me, but I think I'm here to stay. Weather follower, hi, Joe. I'm streaming on my channel as well. Uh, oh, cool. Right on. Well, it's a good day to stream. It's a beautiful day here. 21.8 degrees Celsius and 55.5% humidity. Vincenzi, got any tips on growing Bismarcky from seed? Yes, I managed to get five pop. Cool. Well, I've grown lots from seed. The, the problem is after I had them germinated, um, I put them into a cold greenhouse that wasn't heated in the winter time, and they petered out. And I think what happened, they rotted in the cold, damp soil. But I germinated them all in the baggy method inside. I collected the seed at uh, Fort Derussi in Honolulu because there's a grove of them there. And uh, keep them warm. Uh, yeah, keep them moist, but keep them warm. And uh, once they uh, sprout, give them some nice sunlight. And that was the problem here in the in the wintertime. We're lacking the sunlight. Our, our greenhouse is unheated, so it's cold, it's damp. And uh, the Bismarckia absolutely hated that. So that was the end of the Bismarckia. Do you have red cordyline? Yes, we do, Ken S. We have them in the garden. We have some small ones. They were bigger. Two years ago, a rabbit got in and chewed our cordyline. They were about this big. And the, and the rabbit came in and cut them right down to ground level. It's all right. I caught the rabbit. I caught him in a trap. And uh, But anyway, they, the cordylines have come back, but they're not as big as they were, the red ones. But we have big green cordylines. We have lots of cordylines in our garden here. I'm hoping our big ones will uh, bloom soon, not this year, maybe next year. I've had them bloom before. And, you know, uh, just before the bad freeze in December 2008, we had some really big ones in the garden that bloomed. And then they got cut down to size in December 2008 freeze, got down to 18 degrees Fahrenheit, and it nuked those cordylines. But they all came back again. So they don't like cold weather, really cold weather. They're, they're a long-term zone 9A plant. And we did drop into zone 8B that year. Uh, you think you need some permanent something to dig trees out? H Hus? Not here. You wouldn't. 
No permanent on our island needed. You got to remember, this island is not incorporated, okay? We're unincorporated. We don't have a mayor. We're, uh, we don't even have a town. We have a village, okay? Our village is called Ganges. So there's no mayor. There's no council. And uh, anything goes here, man. It's the way it is. If you want to dig out a plant, you dig out a plant. If you want to clear cut your property, you can cut it out. But I wouldn't like to do that. I mean, we cut down trees for firewood, but uh, I mean, there are some set rules with the Islands Trust, but uh, like I say, there's no mayor here and no council. It's different than a municipality. Do you have any red? Okay. What else do we have here? We got a lot of people in there. Cool. This is good. I like to see you guys in there and I'm glad you're having a good day. It's too bad. It's Sunday. I got to work tomorrow. I think after this live stream, I might go out for another uh, motorcycle ride because it's just so uh nice out and i might take wendy's granddaughter for a bike ride if she wants to and because uh, she is leaving tomorrow i think she's heading over to victoria to see her grandma so uh, i might take her out for a motorcycle ride anyway cordyline australis are um hardy here the green ones and the red ones but i'm gonna let you know red star uh, cordyline the red cordyline are less cold tolerant than the green cordylines Do you have any uh, any tips on taking off Psychus Revolution? No, I've never done that before, but I know people do it. Hey, oh, check out Wendy's latest hey, piece hey, of hey. check out Wendy's latest piece there of art here. So this is a piece of driftwood I here. Do surfboards too. She does uh, oh, skateboards. She does skateboards. skateboards. Well, you probably do. Skateboards. You could do surfboards. I could. This is uh, this is a piece of driftwood that Wendy did, and what that tree is okay. a native Arbutus tree. So oh, see behind right. me, behind me up there, that big oh, green BLE. Yeah, that's a there. native Arbutus tree. Yeah. And that's what's on her painting there. Oh, so the she was just working on this. I'm working on it now. It's hard to see it. You can see it. I can see I it can. totally. Yeah, I can totally it's see it. It's a driftwood. What's the back look like? Well, it's driftwood. It's driftwood. See, so that's what it looks so. So they can hang it on a wall. It's almost, it's quite thin. We incorporate a lot of driftwood into our garden, yeah. but we also like to work with it. So I carve it into folk art tiki's and Wendy likes to paint it. And uh, yeah. what she does, she dremels. She dremels the edge of it. Dremel, yeah. Um, so if you're looking for cool driftwood art, she got really it. She does. Cool. She does it's ship like it too. About four or five feet. No, four feet. Five, yeah. Five feet yeah, it's pretty cool. Hang on. I, I like that one. So anyway, that's going into her art gallery. It's the ocean and the if you're on Salt Spring Island, visit Gallery 59. There's lots of Wendy's art in there, and then she's got her studio too. So it's nice that things are back open again. We've opened up the gallery a week or two ago. And uh, yeah, it was a couple of weeks ago she opened up the gallery. Like I say, the B and B is now open, and we had our first check-in last night. Oh, I hear the bells ringing on the on the gallery gate, so it looks like there's some tourists here coming to visit. Uh, my plan for the future is life. You're living right now. I'm currently in university. Sweet. Well, that's good. Good for you. That means you're young. So if you're young, that's a good thing. I'm getting old. I'm 56. I wish I was young like you. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, good for you. That's a good plan. Uh, yeah, it's a good size piece she made there. She makes some pretty funky art. You know, years ago, uh, my, my oldest son was a sponsored skateboarder. And I, I've told this story before. And he used to just go through decks like you wouldn't believe. Because he was sponsored and he'd get these free skateboard decks, right? They'd give them to him at Island Escapades. And, uh, you know, if they got chipped or whatever, he'd take them off and put new trucks and new wheels on them. And, and he'd discard the old ones. But I saved them all. I didn't chuck them out. I saved all his old skateboard decks. And I had them stacked in the basement, a big pile of skateboard decks. And I got a lot of my old skateboards when I was a skater back in the early, or the mid seventies and uh, mine are still in really pretty good shape, but they're the old school skateboards. So his decks I saved and Wendy looked at them one day, she says, I can do some artwork on those. So she's painted up a lot of these skateboard decks and with tropical paintings on the bottom and they look really awesome. They're in the gallery. So um, I think I've got a video on them. They're actually pretty, pretty funky. I know a skateboarder would like to have those and put their trucks and wheels back on them and just grind that painting right off. I could never understand that. My my oldest son, when he got a skateboard uh, deck, it always have a nice mural or something on the bottom. And within an hour of him skating and grinding, it'd be all gone. Or most of it would be scraped off. Where are your salvage shades you found? Um, I gave them to Wendy. And uh, well, I'll tell you what happened with the, the salvage shades. She's got them. She cleaned them up because they're really dirty. The, the, the lens, they were UV uh, lens or polarized. It was starting to come off. It was actually because they sat there for 10 years. So the frames were good, but this was starting to wear off the actual lens. So I don't know what she did with them. She might have chucked them out. She might have saved them. But 10 years later, found my um, uh, sunglasses that popped off my head. Isn't that crazy? So, uh, yeah, I should have warned them for this uh, live stream. I don't know if she's I'll have to ask her if she has them. She might have them still or she might have just tossed them in the circular file. That's crazy. That's how few people use that park. 10 years later, they're sitting on the ground where they fell off my head. Isn't that bizarre? 
uh, just like, wow, I was kind of blown away. Not a lot of things surprised me. And anybody could easily pick them up because when they walk by there, they're just sitting by the pathway. Where, okay, uh, at what point in your life did you move to, or what point in my life? Huss, I've been here for three decades now. I moved here in my 20s and I'm 56 now, okay? So my parents bought on Salt Spring Island in 1978, okay? So they bought uh, 10 acres here. And then in 1980, they bought 2.3 acres with a house on it. So we always had a summer place here. So I'd come over from Vancouver, from the mainland, and spend a few weeks each summer here. I'd come over for weekends throughout the year. And I thought, you know, it would be a good place to retire. And uh, what really got me going was when I planted some uh, palm trees here in 1989 at my folks' place, little seedlings. And uh, they were getting whacked and beaten in the winters out where I lived, uh, southeast of Vancouver. And uh, my sister lived over here back then and I'd phone her up. I'd say, how, how are the palm trees doing? She said, oh, they're perfectly fine. So when I'd come over to check the palm trees, they were perfectly fine. I go, you know what? I got to get out of this cold, uh, colder winter climate where I was. And uh, what I did, I sold my place over there and uh, moved over here and uh, never looked back. Way better here than over there. I'll put it that way. Attempted to murder uh, Musa Baju with dumping a truckload of fertilizer on it. Pissed and growing. Yeah, they're pretty tough things to kill, uh, Zach. And uh, even digging them out and trying to get rid of them, if you leave pieces of the corn or the tuber in the ground, whatever, they're going to come back again. Musa Baju are very tough. Uh, I love the boardwalk in your vlog, particularly those shot early in the morning. Yeah, well, uh, Vincenze, I, I, I work out there, right? So uh, when I start my day in the morning, I go um, into the uh, park, Centennial Park in the morning. And there are a lot of nice palm trees in Centennial Park and eucalyptus. And, you know, I clean up the garbage and I got to clean the public restrooms. And then I walk out to Grace Point because we have a park at the end of Grace Point and we look after the pathway and the beach. So what I go to down there is clean up beer cans on the beach because there's always a few hooligans that like to party down there. Uh, thank goodness most of the time they throw them in a decrepit, dilapidated old boat so I can pick those beer cans out of there. But uh, yeah, there's a, on my walk, sometimes I like to have my camera running so you can see along the boardwalk. And on the inner core of Grace Point, there's a lot more palm trees. There's oleanders. They've cut down most of the eucalyptus trees there. There's, uh, I think there's maybe only about four or five eucalyptus trees left. Maybe half a dozen in that whole complex. It's really sad. There used to be some monster size eucalyptus. There was a huge blue gum in there, uh, a Tasmanian blue gum, and they cut that one down too. They cut down the cordy lines. That gardener in there needs a kick in the hiney. I'd like to kick her right over the board rock into the ocean. It upsets me every time I see what she's done in there. Just absolutely disgusting. There was 75 foot tall uh, white gum at the entrance. Big ones you couldn't wrap your arms around. And the blue gum was huge. And it was growing there 20 years. It just shows you how mild that climate is. Uh, they cut down the Dollarian Pliana. They cut down the Perinianas. Uh, there is Nitens there. There's uh, Jonama Snow Gum. And there's Passiflora. There's Gunnii. There's Neglecta. I think there might be. And there's a Dollarian Pliana left. And uh, they cut down another gun. Did they cut down the dollar in Plana? There was two side by side. They cut down one. It was right on the ocean. And uh, they also. It's a beautiful area. It's a high end uh, condo complex would sell for a million dollars a unit. So they're very uh, high end uh, condo units. And uh, yeah, they're about they're about a million bucks a piece to buy into that place. Uh, they're about twenty five hundred square foot each unit. But uh, you're in a very good microclimate and you can grow uh wonders in that place the gardens are amazing and uh it shows you can see it uh when i walk through there's some nice bottle brush growing there's some big ones there's acacia melanoxalon beautiful camera ops there's lots of camera ops growing in there and uh i like the carpenteria there's a huge carpenteria big bay leaf trees lots of magnolias and uh some pretty uh pretty funky stuff growing there's even uh sino grandi or is it califidum there's a big leaf um uh, roto growing in there too and uh, there is a Fremontia tree and this and that and the other. A mixed mash of everything. Yes, H. Huss, are people on Salt Spring Island mostly old folks? Yes, they are. 60% of our island is retired. About a third of the population here are American. And uh, most people here that are working class have about two or three jobs to make ends meet because it's a high cost of living. All right. Or you're self-employed. There's a lot of tradespeople here. There's a lot of building that's going on. Uh, so there's plumbers, carpenters, electricians, uh, you know, carpet cleaners, things like that. Uh, a couple of daycares and uh, yeah, self-employed, a lot of artists. There's a lot. There's art galleries all over our island. And that's what this is. We're, we're, we have an art gallery, too. So this is the studio tour map. And um, we are 
uh, gallery number 16, uh, studio 16, gallery 59. I'll put my glasses on and read you what it says about ours. Art spirit of the island. Gallery 59 has art for everyone in an enchanting exotic garden. Wendy and Banana Joe, uh, Wendy BC artist. And uh, then it shows you where we are right here. Gallery 59, North End Road. And uh, nature, unique cards, paintings, etchings, books, magnets, tiki's, palms. And uh, shows your hours here. So these are all the galleries that are open on our gown that are on the studio tour. All those red dots on there with numbers. So that when you're on Salt Spring, if you want to visit art galleries, there's art galleries all over our island. It's a very artsy, fartsy place here. And Wendy is an artist. I don't consider myself an artist, but I do like to carve folk art tiki's. But I don't think I'm an artist. Yep, we have high school here. We have the only high school in the Southern Gulf Islands. We have Gulf Island Senior Secondary. All of my kids went to there and graduated from there. And all the outer, outer islands uh, come in by school boat every morning. If you watch the latest video I uploaded this morning, I did upload a uh, video on the school boats. And they come in every morning to attend the high school. Uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four. We have four elementary schools and one high school and one middle school here. And we have three fire halls and a police station. And we have a hospital. We have everything here. We are the metropolis of the Southern Gulf Islands, okay? I wouldn't live on any other Gulf Island because there's no hospital. And there was no high school. Uh, Vincent, it just got some mountain papaya seeds. Oh, cool. Yeah, I heard they're pretty hardy. Um, anything similar? No, I've never tried mountain uh, papaya. Uh, senior vlog on figs. Yeah, uh, there's lots of fig trees here. And, you know, they, we grow them commercially here. There is a fig farm down the road from us here uh, with about 180 fig trees. And uh, there's lots in private garden. There's some big trees here. We have a lot of fig trees in our garden too. Fully cold hardy. Figs are fully cold hardy on the Pacific coast of uh, Canada, but uh, I've never tried mountain papaya. I've grown papaya from seed and uh, unfortunately, and I, you know, they got about yay big and then I put them in the greenhouse in the wintertime. They got botrytis on them. It was too cold. They were just tropical, run-of-the-mill papaya. I scraped the seed out and grow them and they're very easy to grow. Hey, I'm working on a uh, mango right now. I think my mangoes actually sprouted. The last one I sprouted was uh, doing really well and then it kind of dried out. It wasn't very happy when we went to Maui. So kind of downhill when we went away for to Maui. Do you think sago palms grow? So yeah, oh yeah, we have sago palms in our garden. Uh yeah, they they will grow outside here long term in a sheltered spot. I hear a lot of activity going on up in the must be in the gallery, must be tourists there visiting the gallery. Um yeah, we have uh one, two, three, four, five Six. We have six sago palms. And uh, yeah, we have some in pots out front that stay out year round. And we have uh, three in the garden. And no, we have three in pots and three in the garden. So we have six uh, cycas in our garden. And uh, yeah, there's a nice one growing and not a lot of people grow them. But if you put them in a sheltered microclimate, they're okay. Um, there is one in a friend's garden. He's a Palm Society member. He planted it 20 years ago. And it's probably got a trunk on it about uh, this big now, I guess. Yeah, I guess the trunk is probably about this big and it's growing in an alcove of his house. I have videos of it here. He's the same guy that grows the Phoenix canariensis in his garden. He's got a super huge Trachycarpus latissectus that's probably 20 feet tall now. Absolutely awesome. Uh, he's got brahias. He's got three brahia edulis in his garden too. Been there about 20 years. Really, really nice. Uh, really cool garden. He's about, he's about 25 miles southeast of Vancouver. They get more heat units. Does get a bit colder in the winter. So uh, yeah, he gives it a bit of help. In the wintertime, the uh, Phoenix, he does have to give it some help. But uh, its I don't know how he helps it. It's pretty big. It's up over his house. Yeah. So, uh, and same with Livestona grow here too in a sheltered location. Livestona chinensis. Can you tell us a little about between Brahia Armada and Edulis? Vincenze. Okay. So the difference between the Mexican blue palm and the um, Brahia Edulis, the Guadalupe palm, is of course the color in the leaves. Uh, we grow Brahia armata. I've grown Brahia edulis. Had one in the ground for 10 years. Did very, very well here. Then the bad winter of December uh, 2008 came and it weeded out the wimpy plants. And unfortunately, the Brahia edulis was a wimpy plant for the winter of 2008. And at 18 degrees Fahrenheit, it killed it. And it wasn't a one night thing. We had 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Then it got down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in the lower 20s, but the daytime temperatures were just below freezing. So it wouldn't get below freezing and it stayed like that for about a week. 
about five days. And that was enough to kill the Brahia edulis. Uh, it also uh, really damaged uh, our bigger Brahia uh, armada. So the, the Mexican blue palm Brahia armada has very stiff uh, blue uh, fronds on it. And it's probably the closest thing in a cold climate you're going to grow to a Bismarck in Nobilis. We have two in our garden. They absolutely are doing beautiful. If we ever have a winter like 2008, this time I'm going to protect them. I'm going to put, maybe I put a plastic bag over them, keep them dry. The ones I had were right out in the open and it didn't like it. So, uh, but cold hardiness in this climate, Brahia edulis stands up to the winter wetness more than Brahia uh, armada. Brahia edulis is a little faster growing than Brahia armada in this climate. I do know of some in private gardens, okay? Uh, like I say, my friend uh, southeast of Vancouver has three Brahia edulis, and I would say the tr tallest trunk on them is probably close to six feet tall, and they're big. The fronds are big. I got videos of them here. There's a fellow in Victoria that has Brahia armada and Brahia edulis in his gardens. Same again, big, six-foot trunks on them, and uh, I think when in 2008, he might have given them some help to get them through, and they are basically on their own. I know of another one in Tofino. So Palm Society members do grow them. They're not common, but they are in private gardens for sure. They like full sun and they like lots of heat units. Has anyone ever told you that you look like, uh, no, you know what? It's not. Yeah. No, you know what? Tell, they tell me I look like Bill Goldberg. It's funny. I've never been told I've been looked like Steve Austin, the wrestler, but I get that a lot. Uh, Goldberg, the wrestler, Bill Goldberg. And it's funny. I'm sitting on the beach on Maui and uh, these guys would be calling me Goldberg. Hey, Goldberg. And I, and I said, well, I mean, I'll take that as a compliment because I like Goldberg as a wrestler. He was a good guy. He's a big dude, man. I'm not a big dude like him. I think that guy's like 275 pounds. He could probably press Wendy and me at the same time. Well, this guy said I look like uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. That just fell off the tree. Stone Cold Steve so Austin. Uh, yeah, well, that's good. We'll take that as a compliment, too, because he was uh, quite the good wrestler, too. There's a lily off the uh, cardiocrinum gigantium. It fell off, so I guess it's going to be uh, done soon. So nice lily to grow, cardiocrinum gigantium. Giant Himalayan lily. Absolutely beautiful. Ours has seven flowers on it this year. Five years it took to bloom. Five years I planted that bulb, and this year it has beautiful flowers. Steve Austin Goldberg were both awesome. Yeah, they were. I used to watch WWF all the time. When I was younger, back in the 1980s, that was our thing. Once a month, we would watch it live at Madison Square Gardens on the satellite dish, and it was three hours of live WWF. That was before his WWE, and Vince McMahon was still there, of course. Mean Gene Okerman was the ring announcer, and uh, we would order a pizza, and we'd gather around the TV set because I had a satellite dish, and we'd watch three hours live. I remember watching, and I know how many of you guys are into wrestling. It's fun to watch. It's entertainment, right? I remember watching Hulk Hogan in January 1984 beat the Iron Sheik for the world title. I, I have it on video somewhere. I think I VHS'd it. That was 36 years ago, 36 and a half years ago. I've been watching that a long time. It's fun. I haven't seen it for a while, but uh, it was fun to watch when we were younger. And uh, yeah, it's entertainment. I've been to a few. Uh, I've been to probably about eight or nine uh, WWF uh, events in Vancouver when I was younger too. Get ringside. Ringside is always fun to watch. And they're big boys. Uh, wrestling has really gone off the rails. It was better. But yeah, I liked it back in the day. I love ravishing Rick Rude. Oh, Rick Rude. I remember him. I think he died. I'm pretty sure. Sure, he died. Then there was a guy called Mr. Wonderful. There was, um, oh, um, oh, what's that guy? Randy Savage, Macho Man, uh, Brutus Beefcake. Uh, you remember Brutus Beefcake? Um, oh, there was, a, there was a ton of them. And I saw a lot of those guys live in Vancouver when they would come and uh, put on their show. I saw Andre the Giant a couple of times. Man, that guy was big. I was sitting ringside, and that guy was massive. I saw him two different times in Vancouver. Uh, but I, I do remember Ravishing Rick Rude. He was more W, um, uh, what was it? It wasn't WWF. He was on the other guys with the Road Warriors, I think. I'm pretty sure he was on uh, AWA. Yeah, it was AWA Wrestling. I'm pretty sure that's where Rick, Jake the Snake Roberts. He was on AWA. And then I used to like to watch the Mexican wrestlers too. Mexican wrestling was great. A lot of the guys wore the masks. It was great watching those guys. They're really acrobatic and doing flips and stuff. So it's great entertainment. It's fun. I know people say it's fake. Well, I tell you what. I've seen it for real a lot of times. It's even been here on Salt Spring Island. And those guys get pretty bruised up and red the way they fall on those on those planks. I think it's planks with canvas on it. And uh, some of those guys take a pretty good beating. I mean, yeah, if they clobbered each other if, if, like they really did for real, they'd probably be asked to watch. And we were ringside again. I remember the guy, oh, now I'm here. Oh, man. Bad connection. 
bad connection guys you may lose me in a sec bad connection so if i disappear i'm going to say see you later because the connection just went off so i don't want to be rude uh when i disappear on you but it's the internet connection so if i just finally uh, all of a sudden cut out and disappear it's because of the internet cut out so we'll, we'll keep streaming until i disappear all right and if i disappear i just want to thank all you guys for coming in there and having fun and chatting it up because uh it is a good time it's a great uh, sunday afternoon it's a beautiful day here on salt spring island and uh yeah i hope you guys are having just a good a day where you uh, where you are at your location. I'm sure it's nice and toasty in some of your southern locations. It is just a uh, typical summer day here on Salt Spring Island. Hope everybody had a good 4th of July down there. Uh, Wendy's daughter was going to go down to one of the, on the south end and watch the fireworks in Seattle. You can see the fireworks in the United States from our island. You can see them in Seattle from our uh, high points on the south end of our island, but uh, she didn't make it down there, but uh, it's pretty wild. Anyway, I'll keep, uh, I'll keep live streaming until the connection fails. And then uh, when I disappear, then stay tuned for another live stream. I hear people talking back there. They might be by the gallery. I don't know. There might be some customers there. Anyway, yeah, I should probably be wrestling sometime. It's, it's probably a whole bunch of new people in wrestling. There was like, it was George the Animal Steel, The Undertaker, Big John Stud. It was just a, a mix mash of characters and they all had their character. And I think that's kind of what made it fun. I like George, the animal steel, Jimmy for Superfly snooker was good. Roddy, Roddy Piper was a, a bad dude. He passed away. Uh, there was Brett, the Hitman, Hart, Owen Hart. I think he died. God, there's just so many of them. There was just so many good characters. There was Elizabeth that used to hang around with macho man. It was crazy. Wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, a good hour of fun. World wrestling entertainment. Yeah. Anyway, guys, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what more to say. Um, and I thank you all for tuning in. We're 46 minutes into this live stream. And I only cut out once. That's a good thing. Maybe I'll go to it for an hour. Maybe we'll see if we can make it for an hour. Do you watch Mixed Mar? Yes, I do. Yeah, I do that once in a while. It was actually on last night when we went to the restaurant. I used to watch it a lot more. And I've done a lot of martial arts in my life. Um, I love martial arts. That's what that says right there. That says Taekwondo. It's funny. Um, I got our instructor. It was a seventh degree uh, black belt to write it out for me. I says, because the next time I'm up in Alaska, I'm going to go to a tattoo shop and get that done. So uh, yeah, I've done lots of martial arts my life and I love it. But uh, my last injury kind of put me out of commission. I really damaged my left knee for the second time uh, in a 20 year period. And, uh, and I mean, even back in the early eighties, I was <laughs> getting hurt too, but I, I healed a lot faster when I was a teenager, you know, but as you get older, you don't heal as much. So, uh, yeah, no more martial arts for me, but I do like watching it. It's fun. I hate how they still allow fighters to kick and punch when the other dude is knocked. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not good. Uh, I think when the guy's out, you shouldn't be kicking or punching him, man. That's almost like dirty fighting, isn't it? Isn't that awful? No, you KO the guy, then that's it, and uh, you've won the match. You don't need to be keep pounding the guy, right? Kind of like almost street fighting, isn't it? Hey, there's a sport, and somebody told me about it last night, a friend. It's an Italian sport, and it's the most brutal sport you will ever see. It's on YouTube, and it's this Italian football, and it's like they're doing mixed martial arts while they're playing this Italian football it's been around for 2000 years i've never even heard of it so i went onto youtube and i watched it it's like oh my god like i mean you got the ball and you're running to try to get this touchdown and some guy will come up and freaking do your roundhouse kick or freaking smoke you in the head and knock you out have you ever heard of that maybe it's soccer it's i think they call i thought it was italian football anyway it's just absolutely nuts but it's this gladiator sport that's been around for 2000 years and these guys take it serious and they're big dudes they take it serious, and these guys are ripped and uh, rock hard martial artists and all full contact fighters, but they incorporate it into the sport. So it is absolutely deadly. And I don't think they get paid for it. I think they do it for free. And these are just like working class guys that love this sport. And uh, man, you get knocked out while you're playing this sport. You should try watching it. I like GAs, you know, is, uh, and I, I like GA is, you know, what it, that is in Ireland. No, what is GAA? What is it? Give me the dirt. G-A-A. -A. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Do you watch? Uh, got, uh, let's see. I'm just reading your comments. Yeah. What is, give me, what is uh, HS? What is G-A-A? -A? Now I'm curious. Is it something? Is it a martial art? Is it a gardening show? Is it, uh, is it a plant? It's a soccer bat. Basketball and American football. Oh, cool. 
I've never heard. I've never heard of it. Have you heard of Aussie Rules Football? Well, Aussie Rules Football, I thought, was brutal and hardcore until I watched the soccer. It's unbelievable, man. It is so hardcore, it's not even funny. Uh, watch it sometime. Italian soccer, full contact, where they do uh, fighting mixed martial arts incorporated with it. It's just, I've never seen anything like it. Eucalyptus seeds that just sprouted. I got seeds from Gardens Pacific Horticulture. Oh, yeah, cool. Uh, Ken asked, that is a, uh, the Horticultural Pacific uh, came through our garden uh, last year or the year before they toured our garden. There's a huge perineana growing in there. That's a eucalyptus perineana. That's a spinning gum. And uh, we have a lot of uh, spinning gums on our own property. And one of them, yes, I have to get cut down because it's too big growing over our greenhouse. And uh, yeah, I can't procrastinate anymore. I really have to get that thing cut because if a branch ever breaks off, that's the end of my greenhouse. Uh, back to palm trees. What's the most expensive palm tree seed to get? The most expensive palm tree seed to get? I don't know. I mean, there's some rare palm trees out there. Probably Coco de Mer, double coconut. I bet you that'd be expensive one because the seeds are massive, right? So I, I, that's, that would be my guess. Um, Coco de Mer, the double coconut. Um, I think it's native to the Mascarene Islands. Correct me if I'm wrong. You guys Google up the double, Google the double coconut. But I think seeds would probably be very expensive for a double coconut palm. And uh, yeah, there are other species of rare palms out there. I'm sure that would probably be expensive too. But uh, cheapest are probably Trachycarpus fortunae. I know because I sell a lot of Trachycarpus fortunae seeds and they're really not that expensive. I'm shipping some tomorrow to California. Isn't that funny? Somebody, like I ship a lot of seeds all over the world. I ship them weekly and I just got an order this morning. Um, actually last night, I just checked the emails this morning and he wants seeds in, uh, in California. So I was thinking, why would anybody in Southern California want Trachycarpus fortunae when they can grow everything else? But you know what? I have seen Trachycarpus fortunae growing in Southern Cal. When I stayed in Anaheim, there was a short street uh, right where I stand, lined with uh, Trachycarpus fortunae palms. They didn't look very good. They look a little dried up on the ends and stuff from the climate, but they're pretty tall. Yeah, pretty wild, eh? Anyway, uh, Ken asked, eucalyptus seeds uh, that you sprouted, those are going to be hardy. They are perineana, and uh, spinning gum is a very tough plant. What country does double coconut mass greens? I think, uh, I thought it was mass green islands. Um, Google it. Where is double coconut? I'm, I'm not going to go out of this live stream right now, but Google, uh, where are double coconut palms native to? You can uh, Google that and uh, cut back and let me know. I, I thought it was some island somewhere. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, but that's where I thought they were native to some island uh, in the tropics. And I've seen them grow before. There's some in Hawaii uh, in the botanical garden are big, uh, big trees. with uh, They do get the big food uh, fruits on them. You know, coconut's actually not a seed. It's called a droop. Did you know that? Coconut palm seed is actually called a droop. Okay, I don't know if any of you have ever grown coconuts from seed before. I've grown lots, and uh, well, not lots, about uh, five of them, and uh, they were ones that I brought back from uh, Hawaii, and they were already actually sprouted. Some of them had little sprouts coming out. Some were a little bit bigger, and um, I've had them uh, several years. I've had them survive, and then just for them to get uh, coconut or spider mites on them, they're very, very tricky to grow inside your house and outside of a tropical climate. Okay, so eight hours of sun daily. And uh, high humidity and warmth and sunlight all the time. What country? Okay. Anyway, you haven't Googled that yet. Hey, Chas, you got to Google that. Give us the dirt on it. Where does Coco de Mer come from? The, the double coconut. The most massive coconut seeds. Uh, most pa massive palm seed. I'd like to know. They're from the islands of... Oh, and Seychelles. Oh, okay, there we go. I was wrong. It wasn't Masquerine Islands. Okay, Cool. They're a pretty amazing palm though, aren't they? And the fruit is huge. You know what? Try to find one on Amazon or eBay. I wonder if anybody sells double coconut uh, palm seed. And you'd have to live in a tropical climate to grow it. I don't think it's going to grow in Southern California. You know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of palms that grow in Southern California, but it's more tricky to grow some of the tropical ones, right? Uh, I think there's a few guys that experiment with coconut palms. I know there's some down in Galveston Island in Texas, probably Corpus Christi. And of course, we know in Florida, but uh uh, outside of the tropics, it is tricky to grow Cocos nucifera just because of the requirements. They kind of need exact requirements. It's kind of like growing that tree right there behind me. See that tree up there? That's Carbutus mensaisii. That is the most tropical looking native tree on in Canada. And it needs exact requirements to grow. All right. It needs extremely fast draining soil. It doesn't like extreme high heat. It doesn't like extreme low temperatures. And it needs, um, well, um, it hates root disturbance. That's what I was going to say. It hates root disturbance. So 
It's not a good practice to dig them out of the ground. The best way to propagate them is from seed by throwing the berries into a, a seed tray or I would say a pot. I've grown them in pots before. Get little pots, throw the berries in in the fall. Uh, there's seeds in the berries. 900 bucks. Just Googled it. 902 bucks. Aha! There we go. Okay, so Hus, I would say Coco de Mer. Maybe I'm right. That might be the most expensive palm seed right there. Coco de Mer. But anyway... Um, this is the only place in Canada that our beautiful trees grow. They are broadleaf evergreen and they are pretty amazing. Snowbird flock is here. Awesome. Dave is here. Sweet. I've been uh, live streaming for 55 minutes, 12 seconds. I said to everybody in here, if I disappear, like I did a couple of minutes ago, it's because the connection petered out on me. So uh, bear with me, folks. We'll go for a few more minutes in here. And, um, and then I'm going to walk around the garden and see if anything needs watering, especially some of the plants under the trees. I'm definitely going to hit the bananas. I think I'm going to fertilize them again with some uh, miracle grow. And uh, yeah, it's just an absolutely beautiful day on the southern Gulf Islands. And maybe I'll even carve another tiki after. I did carve some tikis this morning and I do like to carve tikis. And now Beachside Coffee Shop has one of my tikis. So that's a good thing. I gave them a good luck tiki. They're very nice people that own beachside and uh, now they have a good luck tiki i carved beachside right in the back of it for them so it's fun to carve with a chainsaw but if you're going to carve with a chainsaw don't cut your feet off or your arms and legs uh how big is your property our property is two acres we have two acres here uh my last property was over five acres is plenty enough it's a pretty big size property because it's not flat okay it goes like this then it goes down then it goes flat up so it's uh, really nice. And our garden is up on the ridge, up on the top and uh, down on the slope a bit. And down in the ravine, we have lots of exotic plants too. So, and uh, we have a lot of really nice forest to walk through. We have trails through there. Wendy's made a ton of trails and uh, it looks really awesome. We made a really cool trail a couple of years ago, zigzagging down to the bottom. The only way around was the far way before. So we decided to make a trail down this way. And then she's got another trail that goes down to the vegetable garden. It's really quite a beautiful piece of property full of uh, conifers. And of course, up in the upper garden, we have lots of broadleaf evergreens. So anyway, guys, I'll go for a few more minutes and then I think I'm going to pack it in and get a cold drink and I'm going to go down and I'm going to fertilize those musabaji because they're looking pretty gigantic, but you know what? I can make them more by gigantic by pumping some miracle grow into them. I'm guessing buying space at salt spring is extreme. Uh, no, no, there's lots of places for sale here. There's lots of big properties here. Uh, you're going to pay for the big properties. Anything on the ocean, you're going to pay a premium. Anything on one of our lakes, you're also going to pay a premium. But uh, yeah, it is it is costly to buy here. Um, I mean, there's a big farm down the road from us. The North End Farm is 200 acres. There's some big farms. Uh, Caldwell, friend of mine uh, down the road here, uh, uh, has about six or 700 acres. And uh, yeah, there's some amazing... Uh, chunks of property here, but it's been in the pro oh, what does it? Yeah, can I have an apricot one, please? Is that, are they good? Well, you know, they well, you don't like the apricot ones. Know, no, you, you did, you tried it, and you didn't like it. Um, it's the summer side ale one, please. Yeah, Wendy's gonna get me an apricot beer. Uh, yeah, no, so there is lots. Just look up Salt Spring Island real estate, and you can see exactly how expensive uh, it is. You know what I mean? I mean, when I bought here a few decades ago, I didn't pay very much for this place. When my mom and dad bought here in 1978, they paid 25000 for 10 acres, but it's all relative. In 1978, the wages were a lot less than they are now. Hello, do you grow peaches? Uh, no, we have an almond tree, but there's lots of peach trees on our island and absolutely beautiful ones. I have videos of them here and they get loaded with peaches. Lots of almonds and lots of peaches on Salt Spring Island. Uh, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Uh, here's my beautiful you wife. Here's in the back of no, I'm live streaming. <laughs> Here, say hi to these people. There's Dave is in there. Snowbird flocks in there. Oh, hello. Say hi to Snowbird hello. flock. Uh, hi. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to bike to James Bay now. Okay, check James out the Bay. palms. Ooh, cycling? He lives, nice. Uh, you have only one beer left, Dave. Oh, sad Dude. face. Oh. <laughs> well, cheers to you. And uh, this is the <laughs> summer side. Is it summer side? Summer side. Summer ale. Apricot. Yeah. Mm. And I actually wanted to get more of it, but they were out of it. Now, I like the flavor of that. I think that's the one I might like. I don't know. I only like one. Of What's them. going on up there? Is there tourists? Up? Uh, Blair and Kristen Lola. Yeah, they oh. got back. Hi, Wendy. Nice to Hi. see you. There's Dave. You, you remember Dave yep. was here? Hi. Beautiful weather. We watched the gymnast videos. The gymnast. Oh, yeah. It was so cool. Very good. Very You're good. Pretty gym. amazing. Yeah, pretty amazing. There you go. You do see? that. That's like amazing. Yeah, that is strong, amazing. You got to be very strong right? to do oh, that. So there you go, Dave. We watched it. 
and we were impressed. Two thumbs up for your gymnastic Holy. abilities. Wendy, go try that. Go flip over. I got a pull up bar. Go do some pull up. I'll shoot a video of Wendy doing some silly little backflips on it. I have a pull up bar between two trees, and I do I do pull ups every day on it. But I don't do any of that fancy fancy stuff. Yeah, this. Yeah, you know what? I didn't have any luck. I went today to get some sneaky weasel, and they didn't have any of this left in stock. They didn't have any of this at the uh, liquor store downtown either. So very nice. I like the apricot flavor to it. A lot of people don't like flavored beers, but I like it. It's very good. It's actually very refreshing. Yeah, your gymnastics are great, man. Just absolutely awesome. Um, I'm just going to grab some. One sec. Be right back. I'm just going to grab a snack. Okay, guys. Hope you're still there. Hopefully the connection's good. See what I got? This actually goes good with a Summerside Ale. Uptown Pizza. That's a good one. That's a Mediterranean. Yeah, Sneaky Weasel's really cheap, actually. Uh, it was only like $7.79 for a six-pack, so I bought I bought another one today, the Honey, honey Ale. Where is it? Uh, is it here? Uh, honey, honey badger. It's called sneaky weasel. It's made by the same company. That's sneaky badger. Uh, what's the largest standard Mediterranean fan palm in BC? I live in Tawasin and have one that's six feet tall and 10 feet wide. Oh, okay. The biggest one here on our Island is about 10 feet wide and eight feet tall. Uh, Mark, it was planted uh, 25 years ago. There's two of them in that garden. There's also two huge butia palms that were planted more than 25 years ago. You can watch my videos of them here. And those Mediterranean fan palms do have fruit on them because there's two of them in the garden, right? So it's a big one. It is 10 feet wide and about eight feet, eight feet tall. It's a big, big palm. All right. And uh, we have a lot of palms, Mediterranean fan palms in our garden, but our biggest is probably about like this, just because of the poor rocky growing conditions. But uh, yeah, I'm amazed there's some that big in Tuas and that's really good. I wonder if they get uh, protected in Tuas. I know there's lots of trachycarpus palms in Tuas and I remember seeing a beautiful one when I was on a Palm Society tour there. Uh, the tour might have been, I think, 1990. I went on that tour and on English Bluff Road, there was a Spanish style house and it had the most gorgeous trachycarpus palm with fronds top to bottom. I didn't see any Mediterranean fan palms when I was there, but I saw lots of trachycarpus palms but I'm sure there are some Mediterranean fan palms in sheltered uh, locations. And I'm surprised there's one that big there because uh, White Rock and milder than anywhere in the Fraser Valley, but slightly cooler than here in the winter months, uh, Tawasin. That is really cool. I got a good friend coming. I got a friend coming from Tawasin next week, coming to stay here at our b, &B. Uh, yeah, the stream might be bad. You guys, the, the internet's really bad. So if I fade out, it means the connection's gone. So I will say cheers and aloha to all of you and thanks for watching. So if I disappear, that's why I'm saying my goodbyes now. So I'm going to keep streaming until my connection goes. And, uh, when my connection goes, that means I'm gone too, right? It's not that I'm just, um, clicking everything off here. It's just the internet kind of craps out sometimes. Uh, yeah, it's great for the price, Dave, the, the, uh, sneaky weasel. It's not bad. And it says no, you know what? I think the one that I read last night, it said no preservatives on it. The Sneaky Weasel has no preservatives in it. So this is the same company that does it right there. But I really like this apricot ale right there. It's a little weaker than the Sneaky Weasel. At least it works. Yeah, it is working. Staring my bajus out my window right now. They look from above. Sweet. Got to love bajus. Big bananas, right? Uh, well, I'm looking at ours off the sun deck right now. And uh, like I say, when I am finish this live stream, I'm going to go down there with my Miracle Grow, and I'm going to just give her after I eat this pizza. That's my lunch. Right there. Oh, all Canadian beer is no preservatives. I think cool. I thought it was actually only Molson that didn't, you know, until I read it on that one. Mark, I provide minor protection for my medic. My favorite palm is Blue Variety. Yeah, we have it. I have a Camarops Humulus Serifera in our garden. It's growing right beside. You can see the videos of it here. Uh, growing right beside the green Mediterranean fan palm. Um, that one I planted about 15, 16, 15 years ago. 
the uh, green one in that area. And then about five years ago, I planted a serifera. I've grown a lot of Mediterranean fan palms from seed. One I planted about 25 years ago in our garden, in the front garden in rock. I put a seedling in a very rocky, shallow area. And oh, you should see the fronds on this thing, man. You'd swear this thing is like crossed with a trackie, but it's a camera up. She almost never gets protected. They don't need any winter protection here. They are fully hardy here on uh, on salt springs. I also have volcano. I have the variety volcano I've grown from seed, and I'm going to put those in the garden hopefully next year. I find them growing a little slower, though. I still have them in the greenhouse. A lot of palm. That's why I moved here, Mark, from the mainland. I moved here to grow more palm trees because the climate here is where we are on this end of the island. It is zone 9A. And it's not just palms we grow. We grow a lot of other things. Like on the other side of the house there, I'm going to flip that up. Can you see there? See those trees right there on the other side of the building? Way over there. Those are 100-foot tall eucalyptus trees. And uh, there's another one right here. There's a big one behind us. We have a, we have a grove of 100-foot tall uh, eucalyptus trees in our garden. I planted those from seed a few decades ago, and they are big, big trees. They're white gum eucalyptus. They look very tropical, and uh, they self-seed here. Sometimes they self-seed in the gutters, and you find them in the garden sometimes too. You know, a lot of times the rabbits or deer will get them when they're small though. I love eucalyptus trees. They're one of my favorite trees. Uh, yeah, volcano does look cool. It's a very nice uh, variety of camerops and not common. Probably will never find it in a nursery here. Uh, gotta go see you next stream. Yeah. Okay. See you later. H -Hus. Have a great day. Thanks for joining in. And remember first Friday of every month, I do a live stream and, uh, yeah, take care out there. Stay safe. I'm going to take another bite of my pizza. Mm, that's good pizza. Bad for me, but tastes good. Yeah. Yeah. There's some nice palms in Tawasin. Um, I like the streets that are lined with palm trees. I got lots of videos on this YouTube channel of palm trees in Tawasin. My wife, Wendy, used to live in Tawasin. She grew up there uh, part of her childhood when she was a teenager. And then she lived in White Rock for about 25 years. So, But um, I love how they line the streets with uh, palm trees. And then you got that strip mall with all the palm trees around it. It's just an awesome, palmy place, Tawasin, a very nice suburb of Vancouver. I love pizza. Yeah, it is great. It is good. Um, this one here has got uh, feta cheese in it. Mmm, olives and tomatoes. Actually goes good with that beer, you know. That is really good. And it's nice to see everybody in there. I'm just reading all the comments in here. And there's lots of comments in there. That is good, Dave. It really is. Tastes good on Greek salad, too. This almost tastes like a Greek salad on a pizza. That's what it tastes like. Mm -hmm. I like that. I wish Sundays didn't go so fast or weekends, you know? It's like you get so excited. I get so excited for Friday afternoon when I'm done for the day. And I do love my job. Friday here it was not a nice day. It was kind of drizzly all day. And um, it was like a fall day on Friday. Now it's just absolutely beautiful. Yesterday was nice. So we went to the restaurant and we watched the entertainer. We had a really nice dinner. I had a hamburger and fries and beautiful uh, ocean view. We're sitting right, it's right, it's dockside. It's oceanside oyster catcher. So it was packed with tourists, mostly outside. There's very few people inside. We sat inside and there was very, very few people inside the oyster catcher. But the marina was packed. It was packed with boats, no American boats. Usually our marina is full up with American boats, but no American boats are allowed to come in because the border is closed. I don't know when, I guess they're opening it up end of July, the border. I think that's what I heard, July 21st or something like that. Does anybody know when they're opening up the American border? Another ordinary day here, but that's okay. Well, that's okay. I mean, it's nice. I enjoy the weekends. Um, I always get a lot done on the weekends. And uh, now that my bike's on the road, I always like to go out for a ride at least once a day, you know, just a short ride, go to town and uh, maybe go for a, uh, go for a snack and then, uh, then ride back. So I got to get my money's worth out of my insurance. You know, like I say, I put a little tick on the calendar every time I go riding, I think I need to go for at least a hundred rides and I'll feel good about the insurance I paid for that bike. Right. Hopefully tourists don't decide to teleport their fast rate, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of tourists in town right now, Dave. Full of tourists. There's a lot of people. I know a lot of people on this island. And most of the people in town today I did not recognize. They're not from here. You always can tell the tourists when they're looking at everything and they're taking pictures of everything. Or they have cameras around their neck. And they don't dress like the islanders here. They definitely don't dress like the islanders here. Islanders here don't really dress up. Tourists always dress up really nice. And I'm not saying that the islanders don't dress nice. It's just that the style of clothing here on Salt Spring Island is different than a tourist style of clothing. You know what I mean? So they really stand out. Tourists stand out to me. And they always walk in, in groups or pairs from the hotel to town. They're always walking from the Harbor House Hotel or the Seabreeze Hotel or the Salt Spring Inn. And they always kind of come in little groups, right? You know, so uh, yeah, there's it's there's it's full of them in uh, in town right now. So hopefully everybody's staying safe. You know what I mean? I'm listening to the birds right now. It's actually very, very nice out here. Very relaxing. I could just about go to sleep, uh, sleep doing this live stream now. That's how relaxed I am. You probably don't know if you guys can hear the birds. Yeah. Yeah. No, we need the tourists here. The tourists, uh, that's what our, our economy is based on. So we do need it. Wendy's so happy the B&B is open. I don't know if you heard that when I was streaming. Oh, there goes my connection. Bad connection. We had B&B guests check in last night. So our B&B is now open. Oh, you can hear the birds. Cool. Yeah, there's a lot of them in the background. Yeah, we got people staying in our B&B right now, which is really good. Wendy's so happy. So uh, B&B is booked all next week, too. Wendy's going to be busy sterilizing it between each chicken. Mm -hmm. Hawaii needs tourists, too, but... Hana, Hanani K. Wow. Well, they thrive on tourism. Hawaii, I mean, without tourists, they'd be dead, right? They, there would be nothing. Uh, Waikiki, especially. Well, even Maui, where we go, there's a lot of tourists here. It's all Canadian tourists. We go to Kie. So I don't know what they're doing. I'm sure a lot of businesses are suffering. I mean, they're definitely suffering here on Salt Spring. One of my favorite places on Maui is called uh, the, the Maui Tropical Plantation near Wailuku. And I heard they've actually shut their doors for good. And it is an absolutely beautiful garden and a restaurant. Oh, it's just unbelievable. Maui Tropical Plantation. And I heard they actually closed their door because I think this has affected it. You know, I mean, it's really sad. I can't tell what I'm seeing. Is a thunderstorm or just slightly darker clouds? Yeah, it's here it's totally clear. There's not a, not a cloud in the sky here. It's absolutely beautiful. It's so beautiful and sunny here and crystal clear blue skies i got the i got the umbrella up right now the shade i have shade from the sun because it's pretty bright listen to those birds man it sounds nice yeah i would like some more rain i don't see any more rain next week i see a whole lot of the same as what we're having right now so uh we're sitting at about 20 maybe 22 degrees right now and uh and it's just perfect out we might get rain soon. Well, that's okay. You can send it down here. Palm tree, dude. I can't tell. Seeing snowbird flag. It was really sunny this morning. Yeah, it's really, really, really nice here right now. It's just, it's calm. There's a very, I can see just a few leaves moving on the tops of the eucalyptus trees. But you got to remember, those are way up there. We're in this really neat little pocket. The wind goes up and over top of us. It can be really windy out. You see the tops of the trees moving. And nothing much moves down in the garden, right? You know, it's like the, the tarps on our wood pile. I don't even have anything holding them down and they never blow off. Like the cold frames I put on our palms, cold frames, they're just sitting on there. There's nothing holding them down. They're not screwed. They're not nailed. And they stay there all winter. Nothing blows them off. Isn't that crazy? They've never blown off. In all the years I've been here growing palm trees and putting them in the cold frames and putting Lexan over top, sitting on a two by fours, I just sit them on there. They've never blown off. So that's how little wind we actually get in here. It's crazy. Really, really crazy. Yeah, it's a nice sheltered spot. If you can go, if you can stay out of the cold winds, you can grow a lot more stuff because it doesn't desiccate the leaves. Palm tree, 30 Celsius, you know, it feels cooler. Oh, that's hot. 
30 Celsius is warm. That's uh, high 80s. I guess 30 Celsius is probably high 80s, something like that. Yeah, we're around 70, 71 here, I think, something like that. It's uh, just nice. It just it feels so nice right now. And the humidity is just, like I said, about 55%. So it's very good. It's dry and it's warm. Yeah, 30 Celsius is uh, pretty hot for me if I have to work in it. Uh, right now, uh, if I'm not working in it and I got the patio umbrella up and I got this in my hand, then 30 Celsius is nice. But I, I don't want any 30 degrees Celsius throughout the week when I'm working. None of the guys I work with want 30 degrees Celsius. They want uh, about 18 to 20 is really good for working in. Uh, 30 degrees Celsius in a dry heat might be better. If you got the humidity, forget it, man. It's just supposed to be killer with the humidity. But yeah. Um, Oh, we're going to get some, we probably will get a 30 uh, degree Celsius day or two here in this part. Uh, we usually do, but uh, we don't get a lot of them, maybe one or two all summer. Uh, other parts of our island get a lot of 30 plus days, but that's inland from the ocean. And that's where they grow, like I say, the olive farms, the vineyards, and uh, the figs. They get a lot of hot, hotter, not much hotter days than we do because they're in from the ocean and we're right by the ocean. And people don't understand that sometimes. So... Ocean regulates the temperature. We're up here on this end of the island, right? We're right up here. Lots of ocean, not a lot of land. So you're not going to get the extremes, right? In here where they grow the olives. Uh, where are we? In here. This is where they grow the olives. I guess it's in here somewhere. So you're in from the ocean. You're kind of in the middle. Actually, it's right there. I think that's where they grow the olives, right in there. So it's quite a ways from the ocean. In here gets really warm too, in the valleys. Uh, between the mountains gets really hot, but also gets colder in the winter time. So I wanted a happy medium and I scoped this place out for growing palms and exotic plants. And this was the perfect place for me to settle down and grow what I need to grow. All right. Uh, have the litter bugs been, Oh, the litter bugs, Dave, it's like litter bug central station. Every morning when I go into the park, I'm picking up tons of beer cans and pop cans and garbage and litter and people's clothes and just candy wrappers and crap. I just can't understand. And you know, some people will have a little picnic in the park and the garbage can is probably 20 feet away. And yet they leave all their stuff right on the grass. And you know, one of the guys I work with, we, we clean it up in the morning. We look at each other. It's like, how can people do that? How can people live with themselves after leaving all that garbage on the ground. You know, how could they even sleep at night? I mean, they must not have been taught as kids to clean up after themselves or they're just downright lazy and they don't want to use the garbage can. I would never eat a candy bar or a hamburger and throw the wrapper on the ground, but that's what these people do. They leave everything on the ground and then us parks workers come and clean it up. It is, it's terrible. You know what? I mean, there should be big fines for littering. I mean, $2,000 minimum fine for littering. Another thing I see a lot is when we go for a walk, Wendy and I, I bring a, a bag with us, a garbage bag, and I pick up garbage alongside the road, but I find a lot of beer cans alongside the road, which tells me that people are drinking and driving. Okay, so they're driving down the road and they're drinking their beer, right? And then when they're done their beer, they toss it. Oops, sorry, dog. Sorry to scare you. They toss it out the window. And I see cigarette butts and beer cans alongside the road. So, and we're out in the boonies here. So the only way they're out there is on the side of the roads, but they chuck them out the window. Tampi, I'm guessing Salt Spring Island is like the Isle of Man. Yes, it's probably more like Isle of Wight. The early British settlers here would compare it to the Isle of Wight in the UK. Maybe time to put them in. Yes, I agree, Dave. Yes, come down here and be a bylaw enforcement officer for us, please. People throwing cigarettes in the woods. Yeah, people do that here too. People light fires in the woods. We got uh, people that camp in the woods, and I've seen them light fires in the summertime trying to cook their food. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? First of all, you're not allowed to camp in our parks. And second of all, there's no fires allowed. So they're in the driest part of the year, and they're they're lighting a fire. We got little rocks around it, which doesn't do anything because that'll burn down into the ground. It can burn the roots and come up, you know, up into the trees and burn, uh, start a forest fire. And they just don't care, or they're just not smart. So I have extinguished a few fires in the uh, forest, small ones, campfires. Uh, is Salt Spring separate from Canada? Uh, no, 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 no. It's uh, not. We're uh, we're can we're Canadian, hundred percent, man. We're in the Southern Gulf Islands, so uh, not separate from Canada at all. Guernsey in the UK is uh, 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 got their own government, and I think Isle of Man might have their own government, like Guernsey, and they have their own currency too, if I'm correct, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but Guernsey and Isle of Man have their own uh, government, I think. 
I hope they fall their own. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, they light a fire and they fall in it. Maybe right on their hiney. That'd be even better. I see activity behind me. Pretty sure. Hey, Wendy. Oh, you are back there. I saw somebody moving. It's Wendy. Anyway. Yeah, no, we're 100% part of Canada, Tam. Uh, you know where the Washington State San Juan Islands are? We can see the San Juan Islands from our southern Gulf Islands. It is the same archipelago of islands, okay? We're just on the Canadian side at 48 degrees north latitude. I will get a video of that. And I probably do have videos of that. I mean, um, it's either on this channel or my other YouTube channel, but I know I have videos of it because you know me, I don't leave home without my video camera. And if I see something strange or odd, I'm going to shoot a video of it. So uh, I probably do have videos of fires, campfires in the forest. But uh, if I was up there and I saw somebody drunk fall under their fire, I'd definitely get a video of that too. That might even go viral. Wouldn't that be good? Yeah, I think you guys would watch that. I certainly would. I shot a few videos today. I'll put them on after. I put a few couple videos on this morning. Are the San Juan? Yes, the San Juans are mild too, but a lot more wind than us. They get way more wind than us. But uh, yeah, mild too, and that's uh, you can see them from our island. Yeah, they are mild. Yeah. They're very mild and uh, very uh, similar, the topography, too. They got the Pacific Madrona trees all over the place and surrounded by ocean. They're very, um, very nice, very pristine and just a really a beautiful place. And, uh, yeah, and they thrive on tourism like here on the Southern Gulf Islands. So I'm on Salt Spring Island. There's Galliano Island. There's uh, North Pender and South Pender. They're attached by a little bridge. There's Main Island. There's Saturn Island. There's Prevo Island. So there's like seven southern uh, Gulf Islands in this group here, but there's islands all around us, you know, like there's Thetis Island over there. I mean, they might consider that a Gulf Island. There's a uh, uh, Tent Island. There's a uh, Penelukwet Island, which used to be Cooper. There's the Secretary Islands. There's Wallace Island. There's just so many islands all around us. Everywhere you look, when you go down to our beach across the street, you see a lot of islands. It's pretty awesome. So, uh, well, you can check it out on map and you can see what I'm talking about. It's a really neat place to uh, really neat place to live. I like island living. It's more laid back. But unfortunately, you have to see the same people all the time because it's not a very big place. Uh, Galliano is a nice island. There's not really a lot there, though, Dave. It's a long island. It stretches past Salt Spring Island. It's like a string bean, the island. I wonder why there are not more native palms on the West Coast. It is definitely. Yeah, no, it'd be like England. There's no native palms there either palm tree dude the only native palms here are in fossil form okay those were native once native but past tense but there are no native palms here now there's lots of palm trees that grow here but they were planted by people you know within the last 50 years or so on salt spring island but uh, there are 70 to 80 million year old palm fossils on salt spring island and what's very ironic there are palm trees growing right in front of them there's trachycarpus palms growing right in front of those palm fossils and uh, I have videos of the palm fossils here. There is some sort of uh, Costa palmate palm. I'm guessing some sort of sable palm or something. And um, they're on a rock face in town. And they used to be flat. And the geologist said they were pushed up. They were pushed up. And they're about 70 or 80 million years old. He discovered them. And, it was, and I only discovered them because I, I saw a friend looking at that rock face quite a few years ago. And she says, Joe, come over. You'd be interested in this. And I said, what are you looking at here? And she says, palm fossils. I go, wow. And that kind of blew me away. Is that ever cool? I mean, I've been here for years and didn't know we had palm fossils. So they're really neat. Uh, that would be neat if a wild sable was found somewhere there. Yeah, well, they do grow here, but uh, certainly no nabal, native uh, sables here now if they were once native. But uh, they do definitely grow here. And uh, you know at a much slower rate this far north. Um, they are best suited for the southeastern United States. And uh, they definitely grow a lot faster in the southeastern United States because you have the heat units that we don't have. You guys get a lot of heat units in the southeastern United States and even in the Midwest. There's some nice sable palms, sable miner growing in uh, even Brazoria growing in Kansas. I know because I see pictures of them posted on people who love palm trees and exotic plants. I hope you're enjoying my group. Some of you people on Facebook who are in my groups and uh, feel free to post your pictures of your palms and exotica. 
People like that. People like to see what other people are growing. They're in the Caribbean and Mexico too. Yes, they sure are. Um, there's the Puerto Rican hat palm. There's uh, which is Casarium, Casarium, uh, Casierum, and there is uh, Domingen, Domin, Domingensis. I never say that thing right. You know the one I'm talking about. Bermuda is native to Bermuda. Um, yeah, there are uh, sable palms native to the Caribbean. And uh, even to, um, of course, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, you got the sable palmetto, sable minor. And one I really like is Cyrano Repens. I know it's not a sable, but it's the saw palmetto. And I like the silver saw palmetto. They are absolutely beautiful palm trees. And that's one I have to try again. Yeah, there's lots of different species of sables. There's sable etonii, sable rosii, sable, uh, uh, sable cross brazoriensis. And uh, you name it. And there's sables. Sable lisa. Sable Lisa is a nice one. Sable Riverside. And uh, a few different sables will grow here. Not a problem. But like I say, a lot slower. I got a bunch of new. Oh, cool. Good for you, Palm Tree Dude. They are nice palms. You should visit some of our islands surrounding the UK. Oh, I know it very well. I know the islands very well around the UK. My favorite is the Isle of Tresco in the Scilly Isles, about 28 uh, 0.5 miles off the coast of Cornwall. You know, my daughter lived in the UK, right? So she lived in Taunton in Somerset. And then uh, her and her husband moved to South Cornwall. Tons of palm trees in South Cornwall. Lots of Phoenix. She'd send me pictures all the time. But uh, it's the climate of the Tresco, of the Scilly Islands, I like the best. Isla Tresco is probably up there with a zone 10. And uh, I mean, Augusta Smith started those gardens back in the 1800s. And the date palms there and everything else they grow is beyond belief. Norfolk Island pine. Uh, New Zealand Christmas tree, there's Washingtonia, there's Jubeas, and everything's mature, huge agaves, massive cordy lines, and uh, it's a place to be. If I lived in the UK, I'd love to live on the Isle of Tresco. That would be just absolutely awesome. It's lapped by the beautiful Gulf Stream current. Uh, even Ireland, too. You get to Ireland, there's lots of palms, Scotland, and all up the south coast of England. Devon, lots of beautiful palm trees. And uh, I got a lot of English gardening books, so uh, and I've had them for years, too. So I, I've known palms have grown in England for a long, long time. And some beautiful palm trees the UK grows. UK has an amazing climate. And a lot of people think, well, it's such at a high latitude. How can that stuff grow there? Well, they do have the Gulf Stream current. London doesn't even get that cold in the wintertime. There are big CIDB palms, Canary Island date palms growing in London, believe it or not, too. And there's some Washingtonia in protected private gardens. I wonder if Kencha would grow in the UK zone 10. I bet you would grow in uh, Tresco. Uh, we have Kencha. We have two Kencha palms in a pot. And two winters, I've left them out, and they survived. I've had them for about 23 years now. Wow, you know most about – I do know a lot about palms. I tell you what, Tempe, I'm in the Palm Society, and I know where palms grow all over the world, okay? I know where palms grow in every cold country in the world. It's not new to me. I've been growing palms a long time. So they are grow in Sweden. They grow in southern Norway. They grow uh, in southern Switzerland at Lugano and Lucarno at 46 degrees north latitude. Uh, in the Faroe Islands, there's big cordy lines. And, uh, oh, that's the Falkland Islands. Sorry, Falkland Islands. I've not yet seen a palm grow in the Faroe Islands, but I think in the Faroe Islands, they would probably grow. Uh, Mount Stewart Garden, uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. There's some big camera ops and beautiful uh, trachycarpus and cordy lines there. Yeah, there's palms all over in places you uh, least expect it. I wouldn't doubt in Iceland, in a sheltered spot, you could probably grow a trachycarpus palm for sure. But uh, I know about the palm trees in England, trust me. Um, my daughter used to send me a lot of pictures of them too. Dad, what's this and what's that? When she was living in Taunton, she'd send me pictures of these cordy lines. What are these, Dad? These massive cordy lines. And there would be like Torbay Dazzler and there would be the bronze cordy lines and, uh, you know, the red star cordy line and then the uh, regular green ones. But big ones and that's in taunton she was right near devon when she lived in taunton it's very mild down there it's great to find people online with the same passion as me all of my friends oh man they don't have friends you got to get them interested in it. i've liked palm trees since i was a little kid right since i was probably about five or six years old i've been into palm trees so and exotic plants so i've been into it most of my life i'm 56 so we're going to say at least 51 years of being interested in palm trees and i've been growing them along a long time palms and exotic plants. Uh, palm tree has been growing about 35 years in the garden and exotic plants since about 1970. And uh, I just always remember pointing out the monkey trees and I was a kid in the late sixties, looking at them as we drive through Vancouver and I'd say, look at those monkey trees, love the monkey trees. I was always infatuated 
with monkey trees. So now we got a bunch of monkey trees in our garden. Uh, yes, I love Gilligan's Island. And that's another thing, Gilligan's Island. Grew up watching Gilligan's Island. Absolutely love that show. Uh, they're all reruns now, and they're even reruns when I saw them back then, but they're still, they're still great. And now I even question, like, you know, how come they brought so much clothes on a three-hour tour? How come he brought all his bags of money, his suitcases full of money, the howls, right? You know, it's like, it never really made sense, but who cares? It was a fun show. Give your friends some smaller plants, a few friends. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you look at it, eh? Gilligan's Island, and it was like the perfect setup. Eh? These people, these castaways on a, on a, a went on a three hour tour on a small boat. Ginger had wardrobes full of clothes. You know, the uh, the the uh, professor had beakers and chemistry sets and labs set up and the Howells had their suitcases full of money. It was just like that's what made it so crazy, didn't it? That's what made the show so fun to watch because. Who on a three-hour tour is going to bring a suitcase full of money, right? You're expecting to come back and not get lost on a desert island. And anyway, if you're lost on a desert island, money's not going to do you any good, right? That was a great show. I don't think anybody's – no, the only two people alive on that show are uh, Tina Louise and Don Wells. So Don Wells was uh, Marianne and Tina Louise was Ginger. I think those are the only two remaining people uh, left on that show. Uh, yeah, you can find – yeah, there is tons of flaws in every show. That's right. There is. But, you know, when you're a kid, you never really pick out those flaws. I just love to watch that show. I'd come home from school, elementary school, and I'd be watching Gilligan's Island, man. It was just an awesome show. I just thought it was the greatest show. And then I'd watch the monkeys, too. Of course, the, yeah, the women live. Yeah, uh, Dawn uh, Wells was born in 1938, so she's got to be 82 now. And Ginger, I think, was born... In 1933 or 1934, I'm testing my memory now. I'm going to say she was born in February 19. No, I think she was born in 33. You can Google it. You can Google when Tina Louise was born. But I think she is, she's up there, man. She's like 86 or 87 years old now. And uh, yeah, I just thought she was absolutely the most beautiful gal. And I like uh, Marianne too. But uh, that was such a great, fun show to watch. And back then, the whole family could watch a show. Nowadays, some of the shows are kind of like parental guidance, right? You can't have your kids watch the shows. They might live to be 118. Yeah, they probably look a lot, a lot younger with all the plastic surgery and Botox, right? I can hear Wendy dremeling some art back there. Okay, so I'm an hour and 32 uh, minutes and 20 seconds into the live stream. It seems to be good. The minute the B&B &B guests return and get onto the internet, it's probably going to mess things up. Um, I presume that uh, Wendy's daughter and her and her daughter are not on the internet. That's why I'm still streaming, and Wendy's not on the internet. But once somebody goes on the internet, it seems to mess things up. And right now, uh, there's no interruptions, and uh, I'm still streaming, and that's good. Yeah, I don't know how long I'm going to live to. If I make it to 70, I'll be happy. So that means i got another 14 more years of live streaming. How about that? Do you think I'll be live streaming at 70? Hmm, I wonder. Wouldn't that be wild? I've been shooting YouTube videos since 2008. So 12 years now, I started my YouTube channel. And uh, I'm still doing it. I know some people do it and they kind of peter out. Some people do it to make a living at it. I mean, there's some YouTubers that are rich and famous. That's not this guy. I just do it for fun. It's a hobby. Uh, I really enjoy the live streams I started. I like, uh, I'm glad that I started doing it so I could, you know, have this uh, kind of, uh, intimate chat with you guys and it's kind of like we're all hanging out together on the sun deck in my garden even though you guys are thousands of miles apart we're all thousands of miles apart but it's really cool and who knows some of us might meet one day i have met dave i've met snowbird flock and his family and i've met a few other people on here too it's really nice hey joe how do you cold stratify snow gum seeds i know there's a different method sure uh put them in the fridge we can put them in the fridge, I think maybe in damp peat moss. Um, I just sow as is and they come up. Isn't that funny, eh? Um, I've taken them off the tree and they've come right up for me. So uh, I've never actually put them in the fridge, but I think some people do like to put them in the fridge for better germina germination. I think you will get better results with a proper cold stratification. And not all our winters are cold enough, uh, what they need for germinating. Uh, you get a colder winter long enough, they will stratify and uh, and then you can grow some of them. So I've sowed a flat of eucalyptus seeds and I can see some of the seedlings come up, but not as many have come up as I would have liked. There are some in there and I sowed hundreds of seedlings, 
but there's there's several seedlings that have come up in there, but there should be a lot more than that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you can put them in the fridge, I think, in uh, in peat moss and leave them in there for a few weeks. There are people in their 80s that live stream. Cool. That's pretty cool. 80s. Well, I don't know if I'm going to make it to my 80s, but if I do, well, my dad made it to 82. So, uh, I mean, I try to live a healthy lifestyle. So if I make it to 70, I'm pretty happy. Maybe I'll make it to 72. Hopefully I'll still be living here and I won't be live streaming from an old folks home. I'll be live streaming from my wheelchair or my walker, right? Well, if I go to an old folks home, I'm going to plant some palm trees there for sure in the garden. I'm going to try to stay away from the old folks homes. I hope that I can live here as long as I possibly can in this spot. That's a problem when you get too old and too decrepit. You have to go into an old folks home when you can't take care of yourself, right? So uh, I hope that's not this guy because I really like living here. And getting old does kind of suck, but everybody gets old and there's nothing you can do about it. 90. Okay, so that gives me uh, 34 more years. Thank you, Dave. 34 more years of live streaming here. Thousands of live streams later. I will be a 90-year-old live streaming here. Maybe I'll do my last live stream on here and I'll peter out right in front of you. So you'll think it's the connection that's gone, but it's me that's actually gone, right? You know what I mean? Not the not the router that crapped out and not the internet connection. It's actually Joe that crapped out. Right here, I'll just like, oh, that's it, gone. And they say, Joe, are you still with us? And I'll be done. That'll be it. That'll be my last live stream right here. How about that? Wouldn't that be something else? That one might even go viral. That'd be kind of cool, but I won't reap the rewards from it. You know what I mean? But that might be my last live stream. Or maybe I'll just be out gardening and impale myself on a sharp yucca. That could be another thing, right? Got to watch those yuccas. Yeah. God, live streaming and then kicking the bucket on a live stream. Oh, my God. It's like one of the gallery owners here. Nicest guy in the world. Owns Steffich Fine Arts in town. Guy's 60, I think, turned, just turned 61. To me, the guy personifies fitness. Every morning I see Matt doing the loop around town, walking. He's got his water bottle. Stop. I say hi to him in my park truck. About two weeks ago, Matt Steffich died of a massive heart attack in his gallery. It's just unbelievable. He would be the last person. He's slim, a really nice dude, and just had everything going for him. He had a family and uh, just a really good businessman. And that was it. Right when he was at work, he keeled over right on the job, just like that, man. You just never know when it's going to be your last day. And everybody was very shocked. They did a write-up uh, about it in the Fishbowl magazine. I should actually get that Fishbowl magazine. It's a local magazine called Fishbowl. It's free, but there's a big write-up of Matt. He had a beautiful 65 Corvette, just absolutely mint. Convertible 65 Corvette. So, yeah, Matt, massive heart attack, and he was done, man. It's just like, wow, Matt, of all people. And, you know, and I'd see Matt pretty much every day walking around town. Happy guy, great guy, really likable guy. And I've worked with him, done modeling. We, when we do the modeling for clothes at Moets, Matt's there with us all the time doing the modeling of the clothes. He's uh, just a really, really fun uh, guy with a great sense of humor. It's just like, man, only the good die young. To me, 60, 61 is very young. I mean, Wendy's 60, for God's sake. Yeah, that's that's very sad when somebody that young dies. Hey, Joe, I sent you some e regins Oh, e regins did you ever get it? Yes. I did, and did I? Yeah, that was. They never made it. No, they didn't like the. Uh, they didn't like the winter. E. regnans is not a hardy plant here. That's the alpine ash, not hardy. We got down to twenty-two point one degrees Fahrenheit in mid-January, and uh, the last of the E. regnans went, man. But I did try, and I do thank you for the seeds. So uh, I'd have to be a little bit more in a southern growing zone for E. regnans. That is the tallest broadleaf evergreen tree in the world is alpine ash. The tallest broadleaf evergreen tree in the world was an alpine ash. And they only discovered that after they cut it down. It was measured at over 400 feet tall. After they cut it down, they measured it. It's like, whoops, shouldn't have cut that one down. Taller than a California redwood, but that was a broadleaf evergreen. California redwood, uh, Sempervirens is a uh, conifer, and uh, the uh, eucalyptus regin and alpine ash is a BLE, a broadleaf evergreen. So tallest broadleaf evergreen in the world is a eucalyptus regin. Massive tree. Yeah, if they had been a bit bigger. Yeah, they were small. That's the problem. They were really small, and it's it's kind of a drag that I lost them. If they were bigger, probably. I have one eucalyptus. I don't know the variety. I've had it in the ground for probably 15 years or so. A friend of mine gave it to me and he says, this is a very tender eucalyptus tree. Right now it's about 20 feet tall. 
it froze down in uh, December 2008, but it came back again. It actually came back again, and it's got a trunk on it about maybe about th maybe about that big, something like that. And it's about 20 feet tall. I do not know the variety. It's the only one we have in our garden. It's different than all other varieties we have, and it is definitely a tender plant. But it froze down at uh, 18 degrees Fahrenheit in December 2008. I have some getting pretty large in North oh in North Seattle. Wow, cool. Well, I'll try some again. Maybe I'll get some seeds on eBay and I'll put some to the test. I mean, I'll put them in a maybe more sheltered spot of the garden or something like that, or maybe grow them on until they're a little bit bigger in one gallon pots and plant. But I don't like to plant bigger root bound eucalyptus. It's not a good practice. It's all better. It's better to plant eucalyptus trees when they're small rather than root bound large plants. They establish better. Yeah, how is Seattle down there? I got a friend that just recently moved to Olympia, which is south to, south of Seattle. Well, you know, Matt, you can see Seattle from the south end of our island. That's how close Seattle is to Salt Spring. You can see the lights of Seattle at night. Yeah, yeah, I sell seeds on eBay, Matt. I've been selling them on eBay since 2008. I sell palm seeds and seedlings. I just, uh, I mean, I ship weekly, right? I just got an order for seeds last night too. So uh, just tracky carpus for two nice seeds, but I ship them all over the world and uh, I get a lot of, I do a lot of eBay sales and I also buy a lot of stuff off eBay and uh, Amazon, but I've never bought plants on Amazon, but I have bought uh, plants and seeds uh, from uh, eBay, not plants, but seeds. I've got banana seeds and things like that from eBay and palm seeds and uh, different types of seeds. So uh, eBay seems to be a pretty good, pretty good source. Yeah, I like eBay and I've always liked to sell on eBay too. It's a, it, it, uh, it's a little, it's a, it's a good uh, way to earn extra money selling stuff on eBay. I'm about 20 miles north of Edmonds. I really live in Ontario, I think. Pretty messed up down there. Wow. Edmonds. Yeah, I know where Edmonds is because they had the big palm tree growing at the hospital in Edmonds. There was a Washingtonia that grew there for years. I don't know if it's still there, but it did grow there for years. Pretty sure it was a filibuster. I don't think it was a filifera. I mean, it, when I was, we always talked about it at our Palm Society meetings and saw pictures of it too. A beautiful palm, the Washingtonia that grew at the Edmonton's, Edmonds Hospital. And it grew near a vent. I think it grew near some sort of uh, heat vent or something like that. So it was a really good microclimate. But I don't think that palm is there anymore. I think it is actually gone. Pretty sure it, it perished. You can let me know if you're in Edmonds. You probably know the palm I'm talking about. Big acacia tree in Seattle, too, growing against a building. I don't know if it's still there. Been there for years and years. Uh, acacia delbata. Bloomed nicely, too, against a brick wall. Beautiful tree. He went from he went from Seattle to the Show Me State. Missouri is the Show Me State, and uh, yeah, that's a, a hot, sticky place in the summertime with all the humidity. Yeah, Seattle uh, climate is very much like ours. Uh, they do get more heat because they're that much farther south, but uh, definitely uh, similar to our uh, climate. The winters are very much the same here as they are in Seattle because you're right on the Puget Sound there. You're right on the water, and Seattle's a very good very good climate. I think Edmonds is a good a climate too. Anywhere near the water, it's going to be very good for gardening. And uh, that's why we chose this end of the island. We are right near the water on both sides. So it's a good place to grow exotica and palms. So what time do we have here? We have 419. I've been live streaming for one hour, one hour, 43 minutes and 19 seconds. So I think I'm going to get off of here soon. Very much so. Our winter lows seem very similar. Yeah, it is pretty similar, probably to the uh, San Juan Islands as well. You're not very much different. So anyway, yeah, our low was 22. Uh, I think it was 22.1 this past winter. I'd have to look in my book, but it was something like that. And uh, yeah, uh, cold enough for some things not to like, but uh, most plants here did very, very well. It uh, it wasn't that bad. We didn't get below 20. When temperatures get below 20, it's... Uh, it gets kind of ugly, right? And that's what a lot of plants don't seem to like is below 20 degrees. And it depends how long those temperatures stay. Well, folks, I think I'm going to back on out of here now. I've done a, a long enough live stream and I'm feeling very relaxed. I'm going to go down and I'm going to fertilize the bananas with the miracle Grow. So from this point on, I'm going to say cheers and aloha to all you fine people for joining into the live stream. And uh, yeah, I'll do more live streams. I like to do just random live streams. So I mean, periodically, if you check my channel and you see me in there, yeah, doing a live stream, 
If not, I'll just be talking to myself. You don't have to join in. If you don't want to, you can just kind of watch and watch me talk to myself. That's always fun too. But if you want to join in, feel free to join in. It's always good to have you guys in there. And I learn a lot from you guys. And hopefully I can teach you guys a little bit about Palms and Exotica too. And uh, we're always learning something new. And it's just nice to uh, see uh, your faces in there. I'm not going to say your faces, your names in there. Some people don't have profile pics or thumbnails in there, but uh, I recognize all of you just by your names, right? And your handles in there. So, all right, folks, take care, stay safe out there. And uh, we will see you guys next time on another live stream first friday of every month uh between 5 and 5 30 i will do a live stream here and i even done i've done live streams on my other youtube channel too jungle josie i might even do another live stream on that channel and see how it goes because uh that channel's got quite a few subscribers too not like this one but uh, uh there's enough on there to do a live stream anyway all right uh matt have a good one snowbird flock dave and uh everybody else in there Take care and have a great Sunday, what's left of it, because tomorrow is Monday. And uh, while well, the weeks go very fast, that's probably a good thing for the work week. Bad thing because I'm getting older that much faster. Anyway, take care and uh, we'll see you next time. And uh, thank all you for joining in. Cheers and aloha from Salt Spring Island. Bye now. <laughs>